Hello guys and welcome back to the ninth episode of my series about Italian presidents, where I don't just talk about the president of the Republic of Italy but also whatever was happening in Italy at the time. Last time we talked about Francesco Cossiga, the president that hated everyone and the feeling was most likely mutual. You will be thrilled to know that Cossiga will have a significant role at some point in this episode, so stay tuned for that. Today we're talking about Oscar Luigi Scalfaro, the president that walked Italy through its most important transition. Let's begin. Before we get on with Scalfaro's career and election, it is important for me to walk you through Tangentopoli, as well as other contextual information. Tangentopoli is not a city, it is an expression that journalists and historians alike use when referring to the time between 1992 and 1994, when politicians were arrested and prosecuted for receiving fraudulent funds from the mafia. In the last 20 years, the rapid growth of drug trade favored the development of the Sicilian Mafia, to the point that it infiltrated the high-ranking positions all over the country. It wasn't uncommon for public enemies of the Mafia to be killed if they ever set their foot in Sicily, where the Mafia ruled supreme. Antonio Di Pietro and Gerardo Colombo, Italian magistrates, took the responsibility to make a widespread investigation called Mani Pulite, clean hands. They initiated investigations on every single party, specifically on the sources of their finances. It turned out that every single major party and a good portion of their members were cooperating with organized crime and accepting funds from illegal sources. At first, the people to be prosecuted were the former mayors of Milan, Carlo Tognoli and Paolo Piliteri, former foreign minister Gianni De Michelis, entrepreneur Salvatore Ligresti and former minister of justice Claudio Martelli. As time went on, they went for bigger targets, such as Bettino Craxi and Renato Altissimo, secretaries of the PSI and PLI respectively. Andreotti and many members of its current weren't also spared from the accusations. Many, however, didn't see the end of their trials. Sergio Moroni from the PSI was accused of building illegal dumpsters and shot himself. Same thing for Gabriele Cagliari, president of ENI and Raul Gardini, another entrepreneur. Among the most notorious people to be prosecuted would be Andreotti from the DC, who was accused of having tight relations with the Mafia, even meeting them once in a while, up until the early 80s. The Sicilian Mafia would kill his critics to appease him. An example would be one that we already talked about, Mino Pecorelli. However, in his last few cabinets, Andreotti adopted a very harsh approach towards organized crime, making their operation more difficult, some think he did that uh, to make his connections to them less obvious. The Mafia retaliated by killing the former mayor of Salerno, who was also one of Andreotti's uh, closest collaborators, Salvo Lima, in 1992. In many ways, Tangentopoli was also the consequence of the years of lead and the P2 conspirators. The Italian institutions had become too sketchy by the start of the 90s. The Italian people were not trusting them anymore, especially when Andreotti was was again Prime Minister from 1989 to 1992, and Cossiga was constantly on his tail, making complaint after complaint over his governance. Tangentopoli had put an end to the reputation of most political parties that vanished afterwards, leaving space for the new ones to fill the vacuum. This was in many ways a transition from the First to Second Republic, with new protagonists, new relations and new conflicts. I think I gave you enough context for now, but let's talk about our star. Oscar Luigi Scalfaro. Oscar Luigi Scalfaro was a descendant of a noble family in Calabria. If the monarchy was still around, he would have probably been a baron. He was very conservative and was a strong believer in Catholicism. He wasn't always a politician. At first he was a magistrate, working at the court of Assise, which is an Italian court that deals with appeals from harsh sentences. He was there from 1943 to 1946. Keep in mind that becoming a magistrate to that level wasn't easy, 
However, he still decided to drop everything and get into politics instead. Scalfaro was part of Azione Cattolica, a Catholic activist group for a very long time, and thanks to that he was easily able to join the DC. He was very close to Shelba, for whom he worked as an undersecretary at the Council of Ministers. He occupied similar positions for many cabinets after that, until he was made Minister of Transportation in 1966 in Moro's III, Leone's II and Andreotti's first cabinet. Furthermore, he then was moved to the Ministry of Public Administration at Andreotti's second cabinet. After the early 80s, right-wing positions in the DC were becoming wildly unpopular, since, as you remember, Moro was planning the historical compromise between the communists and the democratic Christians. This meant that there wasn't a lot of space for people like Scalfaro in cabinets. Scalfaro was seemingly close to the end of his political career until 1983, when Craxi came in and offered him to be Minister of the Interior in his first cabinet, a very prestigious position and a very pleasant surprise. Scalfaro will work very hard and well in the four consecutive years Craxi was in power, getting a great reputation. In 1992, when the elections for the Italian president were taking place in parliament, there were two main names rolling around, Arnaldo Forlani and Giulio Andreotti. Forlani we already talked about. He was prime minister after Cossiga in 1980 and he was secretary of DC at the time of his election. As for Andreotti, you know who he is. Scalfaro wasn't really seen as a potential candidate at the beginning of the scrutinies. However, little did they know that while they were discussing over this, Giovanni Falcone, Italian judge that had specialized on cases of organized crime, was killed together with his wife and some of his bodyguards. As his car was driving through a bridge in Palermo, it blew up, killing most of them on the spot. It was a serious tragedy. It was then that the parliament decided that Forlani and Andreotti were not what the country needed at the moment. They needed someone whose only interest was legality and the well-being of the institutions, and not only the well-being of the party system. Scalfaro was a great example of this. In 1980, when there was that big earthquake in Irpinia, he was in charge of the Parliamentary Commission of Inquiry, where he was able to find many people mismanaging government funds around Benevento, due to his outstanding reputation as defender of constitutional values and fighter against corruption, Oscar Luigi Scalfaro, that had been president of the Senate just a few months at this point, was elected president of the Republic with 672 votes. Now, Scalfaro was probably the best man for a time like this, when the Mafia was killing people left and right and politicians were being arrested almost every day, though he did have his own little skeletons in the closet. There are a few small controversies, almost trivial at this point when you compare it to what was going on. Since there was the Italian Intelligence Agency, in 1993 Antonio Di Pietro and his Mani Pulite group went through their transactions and found many anomalies. Turns out that they had received anomalous funds as well, and some of these funds were even distributed among some of their employees in an attempt to cover everything up. Then, one of the officers of SISDE, Maurizio Broccoletti, claimed that funds like these were not only received by them, but also the ministers of internal affairs in the 80s, except Fanfani, which included Scalfaro. This will turn out being one of the many examples of what about his in Tangentopoli that will later turn out fake. In fact, Scalfaro was very much innocent, and he said so during a speech he read live on TV in November 1993. One of his most notorious sentences was Io non ci sto which can have two literal meanings, I'm not okay with this and I'm not in it, and by this and it, of course, he refers to Tangentopoli accusations. 1992 was not a difficult year just because of Tangentopoli and the Mafia. The economy was also in ruins, the lira was dropping in value and therefore the country needed a prime minister willing to make extreme austerity. Due to the historical events Italy was facing at the time, Scalfaro 
Scalthro had to carry the country out of this, initially on his own. Scalthro decided to appoint first Giuliano Amato from PSI from 1992 to 1993 and then the independent Carlo Azeio Ciampi, former head of the Italian National Bank, who will stay in power until 1994. All these people were appointed by him almost single-handedly, with little to no consultations, since everybody around was on trial for something. The lira had lost up to 25% of its value, forcing it to momentarily leave the European monetary system. Ciampi increased taxes overall and adopted a property tax of 6% on bank deposits, 7.5% if you were a business. The monetary discount rate went from 12% to 15%, but even then it was not enough. The National Bank even had to use some of its hidden funds, but it will take a lot more than that to fix the crisis. This was the result of decades of corruption, neglect, deficit and tax evasion which really sucks. Ciampi's austerity was essential for Italy to actually have the requirements to enter the European Union, which as you know we achieved, but I will talk more about that next time. Scalforo found himself leading the charge towards a new millennium with little money and unpopular weak cabinets. And so, at the end of 1993, he decided he will call off the parliament and run new elections. He will announce this on TV that same day he did the whole speech I mentioned before. However, this election will be like no other election before. In 1993, an abrogative referendum took place. An abrogative referendum is when the people are asked a question, or in this case several, in regard to some laws or institutions and if they agree with what the government is doing. The questions that were asked to the people at the time were things like, should we abolish the Ministry of Tourism? Or should we legalize drugs? And stuff like that. But one stands out in this case should we get rid of the super majority system in the Senate? To which most people said yes. Now I have no idea if the proportional system or the majority system is better or not, but since the elections of 1994 were the first to follow a mix of the two systems, it is easy to see why it was so important. As a result of this change, the Senate now elected 75% of its seats via a plurality voting system in single member constituencies while the remaining 25 would be assigned proportionally in a compensatory nature. Later on, Parliament also passed a new electoral law for the Chamber of Deputies to bring it more in line with the Senate, assigning 75% of the seats via plurality voting with the remaining 25% assigned proportionally in a supplementary manner using a minimum threshold of 4% of the votes. The new electoral system was nicknamed the Matarellum, after Sergio Mattarella, who was the official proponent. Wait, where have I seen him before? That is only one of the reasons why the 1994 election was the transition from the First and the Second Republic. Most of the older parties had either disappeared or became shadows of its former selves. All the politicians that had ruled before 1992 were pretty much unelectable, either because they were guilty of whatever crime or had their reputation ruined. That being said, there were many that stuck around and we will encounter some of them later on. This meant that there was a huge power vacuum and this allowed many parties to feel it. There were three main alliances in the 1994 election. The first one was called Pact for Italy, a centrist alliance which was composed of two parties claiming to be heirs of Democrazia Cristiana, Partito Popolare Italiano and Segni's Pact. The coalition was led by Mariotto Segni, the son of Antonio Segni, former president of the Republic. They got 15 to 16 percent of the votes in both the chamber and the Senate. The other alliance encapsulated all the left-wing parties. It was called the Alliance of Progressives. The biggest party was the Democratic Party of the Left, which was composed of all the moderates from the old Communist Party. It was essentially what will eventually become the Democratic Party. Other parties were the Social Christians, which which was composed of the left 
left-leaning DC members. The Communist Refoundation Party, which was composed of the more radical members of the Communist Party. There were a few others, such as the Greens, what was left of the Italian Socialist Party, Socialist Rebirth, which were Social Democrats, the Network, which was an anti-corruption party, and finally the Democratic Alliance, who were Social Liberals. Their alliance got about 30% of the votes, both in the Chamber and in the Senate. However, what was astounding at the time was Forza Italia, a party that had been made just a few weeks before the election and was able to make two separate alliances with the newly reformed Italian social movement, now called Alleanza Nazionale and Lega Nord. Alleanza Nazionale was a heavily national conservative party, heir of Movimento Sociale Italiano, that never really saw power in the First Republic due to its connections to fascism. That will change though. It was led by Gianfranco Fini. Lega Nord, on the other hand, was a secessionist movement led by Umberto Bossi, who wanted to succeed Italy and divide it into two, North and South. This was because of the North and South divide. Last but not least, we had the genius behind this set of alliances himself, Silvio Berlusconi, that thanks to his access to the majority of the media outlets in the country, was able to spread his message all over the nation and make both his alliances win the majority of the seats in parliament to the amazement of literally everyone. His party was liberal conservative but it had many neoliberal members in it too. I talked about Berlusconi's tactics in the past so be sure to check out my video on him. You will see a link in the description or above. The two alliances he made were called Polo of Liberty and Polo of Good Governance. The first one aimed at getting votes from the north and the second one from the south. At the end, Liberty got 22% of the seats in the chamber and 19% in the senate, while Good Governance got 15% in the chamber and 14% in the senate. If it does sound sketchy, that's because it is. They will eventually change the constitution so that a party cannot be part of multiple coalitions, but it was legal at the time, so Berlusconi won the majority in parliament and his place at the cabinet cabinet was nearly a certainty. Scalfaro was very perplexed. Berlusconi, a man that never held any institutional role, was now also the leader of the most voted party in Italy, and so he had no choice but to appoint him prime minister. Scalfaro and Berlusconi were complete opposites. They had nothing in common. Clearly, it was a perfect example of new versus old, tradition versus novelty. Definitely a problematic contrast. Scalfaro did not trust Berlusconi one bit, and the relationship will be anything but smooth, especially when, in early May 1994, one of Berlusconi's close collaborators, Marcello Dell'Utri, was arrested for falsifying his income, basically tax evasion. Things were far from good for Berlusconi, but Scalfaro allowed him to appoint a cabinet anyway. The first conflict came when Berlusconi wanted to appoint his personal lawyer, Cesare Previti, at the Ministry of Justice. Scalfaro strongly opposed this, instead putting him at the Ministry of Defense. Another anomalous member of the cabinet was Roberto Maroni from Lega Nord, a secessionist. Scalfaro hated this, but he couldn't do anything about it. And he was put at the Ministry of the Interior, which was absurd. Right before Berlusconi's nomination, Scalfaro gave him a letter with a set of basic rules he had to follow if he wanted to stay in power. This was normal for Scalfaro, he had done the same with Amato and Ciampi. The letter gave the following instructions. In foreign relations, the general line should be loyalty to the alliances and the European policies, as well as a policy of peace. As for internal policy, the main values have to be liberty, legality and Italian unity. The guidelines didn't really go against Forza Italia's plans, just with Alleanza Nazionale and Lega Nord, and so Berlusconi just went along with it. And just like that, Berlusconi became Prime Minister on the 11th of May, 19. 
1994. Okay, it's in a few days. Berlusconi's first cabinet was a real mess. It was seen by many as more of an experiment, but even in that case, it did very little and whatever it accomplished was done with little to no professionalism. In late September, the cabinet sent to Scalfaro their first financial law for him to sign. It would be far from a problem usually, however it was because they sent it 15 minutes before the deadline and so Scalfaro was forced to sign it without having the chance to go through it properly. A few weeks after that, Scalfaro started throwing stones at the cabinet, figuratively of course, criticizing Berlusconi for whatever he did similarly to Cosiga. One of the biggest sources of embarrassment for the country as a whole was during a UN conference about corruption and criminality in late November 1994, where Berlusconi was invited. Rumors started to spread around about some accusations of corruption for Berlusconi himself. What was staggering was that Berlusconi received the news after the press and Scalfaro. And so, I mean, what do you want me to say? It's fishy and sad. Shortly after that, Lega Nord started having some internal conflicts, specifically between Bossi and Maroni. Maroni then split this group from Lega, essentially leaving Berlusconi without a parliamentary majority, and so Berlusconi will be forced to resign at the end of 1994, after losing the vote of confidence of the parliament. Funny thing is that, regardless of the awful reputation Berlusconi was getting at the time, he still thought he would be able to win if there was another election, and so he asked Scalfaro to call for another one, so that he could get his parliamentary majority back and make a new cabinet. However, Scalfaro refused, saying it won't be necessary and that instead he will appoint someone else. Berlusconi, after a long session of negotiation, agreed on not having a new election, but on three conditions. Berlusconi will pick the new prime minister, new elections will take place after the end of the cabinet, and three, this cabinet should be very brief. Scalfaro agreed to these conditions, except for the third one because cabinets have no expiration date. The man assigned to make a new cabinet would be a certain Lamberto Dini, an independent that was a Minister of Treasury during Berlusconi's cabinet. Scarfaro would have preferred the young Romano Prodi from the left to be prime minister because he had a lot of respect for him, but Dini was good enough. They actually got along pretty well and Dini's government actually lasted way longer than anticipated to the frustration of Berlusconi. To the surprise of everyone, Lega Nord, that had reabsorbed Maroni's group at this point, voted in favor of Dini. Lega is in many ways a synonym with incoherence, but I don't want to get sidetracked any further. At this at this point, Scalfaro had become the first enemy of Berlusconi's supporters, who were calling him the biased president, and Scalfaro would be later caught saying that with Berlusconi gone, any change was a positive change. Dini's government, even if it was short, gained a lot of support. He signed the Schengen Accords, did some financial reforms, and finally the economy was working again. Another thing he did was to limit the use of the media in political campaigns, as you can imagine, Berlusconi Berlusconi did not like this one bit, but this will be nothing compared to what will happen in a few years. Though Dini's cabinet wasn't perfect, uh, the weakest link has to be Filippo Mancuso, Minister of Justice, who caused some drama at the time due to his obsession with Tangentopoli and the people behind it, and I'm not talking about the politicians, but the judges and the magistrates, who he saw as the people responsible for the fall of the first republic public and the decay of political life. Scalfaro and Dini will eventually shut him up when his um, accusations went a bit too far. Dini's cabinet also contributed to the rising popularity of the left once again. Romano Prodi is rightfully credited for this rise too. This could be seen at the regional elections. 15 regions voted for a left-wing president. In 1996, after Dini did everything in its plan, resigned, and Scalfaro called for new elections. This this time the winner will be the new left-wing coalition, Lulivo under Prodi, who will become prime minister in May 1996 and remain there for two years. 
Overall, Prodi faced two challenges. He needed to prepare Italy to enter the Eurozone to adopt a new currency, and he needed to make a big financial reform. Prodi was uh, very weak at first because, because his cabinet depended on the votes of his communist ally Fausto Bertinotti. Both Prodi and Scalfaro were very hated by the right as well. On one hand, Prodi had introduced new taxes to gather funds in order to enter the EU, something that also workers' unions did not appreciate. On the other hand, Scalfaro was constantly attacked by the right in Parliament, who demanded his resignation. Even Panella from the Radicali, yes, he still exists, gathered 200,000 signatures in a petition that, that wanted Scalfaro to be accused of crimes against the constitution and treason. I guess because as the protector of the nation he didn't want a media tycoon to run the country. Scalfaro will respond to the petition by calling them constitutionally literate. Scalfaro and Prodi worked together many times and had several meetings where they discussed the issue of unemployment, the most notorious of which happened in March 1997 at the Quirinale together with the appropriate ministers. It was was highly unusual, but those were unusual times. In October 1997, Bertinotti decided he did not like the cabinet anymore and left the alliance, forcing Prodi to ask the parliament again for their vote of confidence. Things were not looking great though, so he decided to resign, but Scalfaro still wanted him in charge, so instead he took him and Bertinotti to the negotiation table. Prodi promised Bertinotti a reduction of the mandatory weekly work working hours from 40 to 35 if he came back and so the alliance was restored, however that never came to be. This won't be the last time Bertinotti will be a problem. When the parliament had to vote for or against allowing Poland, Czechoslovakia and Hungary into NATO, Bertinotti were refused to do so, however it wasn't needed. The majority was reached anyway thanks to Kosiga's party. It was called Democratic Union of the Republic. And another centrist Christian party that sadly won't last long in general, but long enough to help Prodi and the former communist nations that wanted to join NATO. Finally, in November 1998, Bertinotti claimed to not be satisfied of what Prodi did so far and left the alliance, this time for good, and Prodi won't have Cosiga to back him up. And so, his cabinet was called off. This video is so fucking long, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> but anyway, Scalfaro tried again to convince Prodi to come back at first, but it wasn't possible. Cosiga then proposed to Scalfaro a certain Massimo D'Alema. D'Alema was someone highly respected throughout Parliament. Scalfaro was skeptical at first due to D'Alema's communist past, but after realizing that Ciampi and Veltroni were significantly less popular picks, he went along with D'Alema who will be prime minister for two cabinets from 1998 to the 2000s. D'Alema brought the stability that the country needed, especially since the conflict in Kosovo was about to start just across the Adriatic. D'Alema still is remembered for being a war government. It didn't do much else, but hey, it worked. In 1999, Scalfaro's last year as president, he will talk about how hard his term was in an interview with journalist Sergio Zavoli, where he recalled that he had to babysit six cabinets and had to pick three prime ministers himself because the parliament had no idea how to. He will be later referred to as the ferryman of the republic for single-handedly carrying the institutions through the painful transition. The economist in Scalfaro's early years even called him the nanny of the country, which was appropriate then and it remained appropriate all the way to 1999, even though the country had changed drastically since the beginning of his term. After Scalfaro's term had ended, he will still support Dilemma as senator and keep his fight against Berlusconi until the end. In 2006, there was an important referendum in regard to the constitution that he was opposed to, but we will talk about that next time. He spent
spent the rest of his life educating people about the constitution, cheering on the sidelines as Italy entered the European Union. He died in Rome in 2012, and a state funeral was made for him. Today, his home in Novara is a nursing home for the poor and the elderly, which is very cute. Thank you guys so much for watching what I believe is the longest video I've ever made, and hopefully the longest. If you enjoyed, be sure to like and subscribe, and even comment if you want. I love reading your comments. Also, be sure to check out the Discord and PayPal link. That is it for today. See you next time.